Good afternoon, and welcome to the TCU College of Education live chat. The Power of Platicas, Elevating Latinx Voices in the College of Education is the topic of this forum for the next hour. Elevating Latinx Voices is important and needed work as we create a sense of belonging for Latinx students, as well as Latinx educators, leaders, and professors in classrooms, on campuses, and in communities. This is work for TCU and beyond. Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Steve Prismas, an assistant professor of bilingual education in the TCU College of Education. I'm really happy to be here today with an esteemed and thoughtful panel of people who know what it's like to be a Latinx student in the College of Education. And before I introduce the panel, I wanna say um, a big thanks to Vivian Noyd and Leslie Ekpe and the Dean of the College of Education, Dr. Frank Hernandez for all of their work to make today's event possible. Okay, so our, our great panel today uh, to start off, we have Adali Freire, who graduated from Texas Christian University with a bachelor's degree in early childhood education and a master's degree in special education. Adali believes that even though the Latinx community is small within the College of Education, they provide one of the greatest perspectives on classrooms across Texas and the United States. Adali, great to have you here today. Hi, thank you so much for having me. It's good to see you. <laughs> you too. Brian Hernandez holds a bachelor's in secondary education in English language arts and a master's of liberal arts from TCU. Brian currently serves as a senior college advisor with the TCU College Advising Corps in his high school alma mater, Polytechnic High School. Brian, welcome. Hello, hello. Hey, happy to be here and thank you for having me. Liz Delia Pignon is an educational leadership doctoral candidate in Kinder Frog School Academic Program Specialist at TCU. She serves on various committees in Fort Worth, including the Cook Children's Hispanic Family Advisory Council, the Early Childhood Wellness Committee, Crowley Special Education Parent Committee, and many more. She seeks to make an impact in multilingual education to give voice to the marginalized and forgotten children. Que bueno que estés aquí con nosotros, Liz. Welcome. Buenas tardes, Dr. P. I'm very excited to be part of this panel. And finally, Ariela Martinez is a college access and higher education professional with experience serving students from diverse academic, socioeconomic, and cultural backgrounds at both the high school and post-secondary level. Her work includes leadership as the TCU TRIO Student Support Services Lead Ambassador, College Advisor via TCU Advise College Advising Corps, Success Coach at Tarrant County College, and Senior Transfer Admission Counselor and Adjunct Instructor at TCU. Ariela, welcome and thank you for being here. So happy to be here. Thank you for the invitation and thank you to everyone who's joining us. I also want to give a really big welcome to everyone joining us on Facebook. So happy to have you here uh, to listen to our panelists um, share their pláticas. Hay poder en pláticas, and we've got some good stories and important things to hear. Our experts will be, be answering any questions that you have about making equitable and inclusive spaces for Latinx students here at TCU. Please type your questions in the comments section and we'll try to answer them. Uh, before we get to your questions, we have some um, prepared questions to kind of start off our, our platica, our charla today. And uh, this is open to all of you, uh, but I'm, I know a little bit about Adali's uh, pathway to TCU, so I'm going to throw it to her first as a means of getting us started. Um, what pathways did you all take to get to TCU? Adali? Thank you, Dr. Prismas. So my route was like the more traditional route. You go from high school into college. Um, I was very blessed to have earned the Community Scholar Scholarship. So that was my way of getting, getting from Dunbar High School all the way to TCU. Um, so like I said, very traditional. Um, I feel like it was unique because not everyone got to get that scholarship. So it was really nice to, get, to go that route. Thank you, Adali. And it is a great honor. 
how how was Adali's experience similar or different for the rest of you? I definitely say that um, for me, it was also very similar. Start off in high school, scholarship opportunities knocked on the door. Um, I had a college advisor that thankfully made me answer the door because um, as a high school senior, I wasn't necessarily as on top of things as I now tell my students they should be. Um, but yeah, so I actually interviewed for both the TCU Community Scholarship and the TCU Chancellor Scholarship. Um, and, uh, you know, blessed to have gotten the TCU Chancellor Scholarship. So that's how I got to TCU. Um, with TCU also being right down the road, it was also definitely a presence that I could feel, um, even a couple of neighborhoods down the street. Thanks, Brian. So I actually took the transfer route to TCU. Um, and so that's why I'm so thankful too to serve as a transfer admission counselor now. Um, but I started at our local community college, TCC. Um, that was the perfect fit for me because financial access was not a thing um, at the time when I really wanted to be at TCU immediately from high school. Um, I got admitted, of course, made my enrollment deposit, really thought I was coming here, but woke up one day and realized I can't put that financial strain on myself or my parents. Um, and chose to go the transfer route, um, which it was a very transfer friendly pathway, um, which was the best thing for me. And I had just moved here from Chicago um, and I got an opportunity to apply to a couple of graduate programs in the area. Um, and I was accepted into the educational leadership program at the College of Ed. Thank you. Thank you everyone for sharing that. Um, I, I think this is, might be a theme that will come up in some of the questions that we get sent. I know um, we have um, a lot of high school students in the room watching us live today and welcome everyone. And um, one question we do wanna to get to before the end of our hour today is demystifying the process of becoming a TCU student. Um, what have you heard? What's the reality? Uh, what are the different pathways? We heard three different, four different pathways right there. Um, before we get to that question, however, um, I wish all of you watching us today could have been live with us 20 minutes before we started. There, the four panelists were talking to each other and there was this uh, theme with uh, Ariella being um, such a support for students on campus. And that kind of support is something that I really hope you all can talk about and share, but I also recognize that being a Latinx student on the TCU campus may not always be easy. And what I want you all to feel very um, safe and, and honest in your critique of your time here. And my second question is, um, in what ways have you had good but also negative experiences being a student here at TCU? Um, would anyone like to start off with you know, kind of a, a summary of your experiences, both good and bad. And Dr. Prismas, I can talk a little bit about that. Uh, so I came to TCU with uh, three babies. I was a mom of triplets and uh, I was called up for orientation and I, they said, hey, orientation's today. So I had to take one of the babies and I showed up at orientation, right? Well, that's not something that's accepted, right? Um, so as soon as I walk in, uh, someone asked me, you know, you're not supposed to bring children to this orientation. So it started my first step into TCU on a, on a bad foot. Um, but then on the flip side, you know, um, I was able to walk into a professor's office and uh, have them say, hey, Liz, sit down, you know, vamos a hablar. Uh, Dr. Christmas was one of the people that helped me know that I was accepted here and I was wanted, that my opinions uh, was valued and, and important at TCU. So I just wanted to give two sides of how it might've started off rough, but uh, when I got here, I know that I'm, I'm, I'm important and I'm valued here uh, and I'm, I'm grateful for that. Thanks, Liz. Yeah, it was definitely something um... I'd say during my time at TCU, um, and it's been interesting now both on both sides, I'm having been a student and now having worked for TCU. Um, I've never necessarily had 
a negative a negative experience um you know being a hispanic individual on campus um but it was definitely something that was almost like a presence that kind of looms off to the side not always evident but still there um and one example of um, an encounter that I had that kind of put me on edge. Um, luckily, it wasn't a negative counter, but I was in a restroom uh, my freshman year. Um, it was in one of the community bathrooms in one of the freshman halls. Um, it was late at night, brushing my teeth, getting ready to go to sleep. And then I have a student, um, and I known him um, for a while. He lived down the hall and he said, hey, Brian. And I said, yes, can I help you? You're Hispanic, right? And I'm like, yes. Um, and it was a little shocking though because at that moment i'm like oh boy like this could go many different ways i'm like why are you asking um but then i was like yeah yeah why what's what's going on he's like so can you explain something to me can you explain what mole is because i don't really know what's all up in it but i know it tastes good and i'm like okay whoo uh, yeah i definitely love to talk about mole and what's all in it because i also love mole um and like to or i have it every now and then um but it was one of those experiences where you know for that split second i was you know I was in that kind of in between time moment where I'm like, is this going to be an experience where I come out of it saying like, oh, you know, being Hispanic earns you X, Y, and Z on campus, um, or is it going to be something else, which luckily it was. Um, but overall, you know, like, uh, you know, Liz Della said, um, fantastic place at TCU. There's lots of people to support you, a lot of organizations, um, ULA, if you were ever part of ULA, the United Latino Association. Um, but it was definitely, it's definitely a place that I think is very conscious of it, which I think is much more than many other places can be saying. Um, and I'm proud to say that TCU is very conscious of, you know, who are individuals on campus and what can we do to support them. Uh, to piggy off of, piggyback off of Brian, so my experience was a little bit different. I actually started off as an engineering major and um, that in itself was, it showed me how much how many resources we didn't have in our district and coming from a title one school i was in the engineering program i had taken some engineering courses there in high school and then when i got to college i had no clue what was going on and everyone else was like oh i did this in high school already i was like i didn't i don't know what this is <laughs> um so that was an eye opener for me but another eye opener was I assumed that everyone who was Latinx, who was Black, who was someone who looked like me, we were all on a scholarship. So you can imagine me going up to another Latinx student and say, hey, how was your interview for community scholars? And they were like, what are you talking about? I was like, aren't you on the scholarship with me? They're like, no. I was like, oh, I'm sorry, never mind. And so <laughs> it was very awkward the first couple of weeks because I was like, are you a community scholar? Are you not? What's going on? So it was really nice to see that some students didn't need a scholarship to go to TCU. And it really, it kind of reinforced the fact that, you know, we belong here regardless of how we got here. I think a lot of it is that, and it's kind of been the common theme, that sense of belonging um, to where it's not necessarily in my experience that I have this one instant or, or many instances, instances connected to being part of the Latinx community but more so that looming sense, like Brian said, to where that sense of belonging really does something for either the comfort or discomfort that you're feeling. And at the same time that it's discomforting, that could make you grow. Um, it's also affecting the way that you are um, experiencing not only TCU, but getting through your education as well. Um, and so when I think back, like the one really negative experience I had was when I had first gotten there, um, kind of like Liz and um, I had gone for advising and um, actually I had gone for advising. That was part one of it. And then after getting uh, my test back in a, in a chemistry class, my professor, I went back for office hours. I was really struggling, like struggling so bad. If I wouldn't have dropped that course, I probably would have lost my scholarship type struggling. And so um, I went plenty of times for help. Um, but one time he just got really frustrated and was like, you came from a community college. I already told people that these students don't need to be in my class. Y'all are not prepared for this. And I was just like, I, I was I was speechless. I didn't even know what to say. I left, I ended up dropping the class um, because I was struggling A, but at the same time, how could I do any better um, if I'm asking for help and, I, and I'm not getting it? Um, and so thankfully that was the only one experience that was really bad. Um, but aside from that, it left me with that thought that Adali said, like, you know, I know I belong here. Like, it's not a sense that I don't belong here, but how do I have, like, I shouldn't have to prove to others that I do. Um, so in that sense, it, it ended up empowering me in a sense 
to better advocate for myself um, and not just for myself, but put myself in positions to be able to support other students who might be having these negative experiences. Um, and so that's when uh, I jumped into roles like becoming an orientation leader, becoming an RA, um, joining student support services to where I'm just making sure that I bring any student in that I hope you haven't experienced anything bad, but if you do, I want you to know there's a community here for you. I'm glad you mentioned uh, student support services, Ariela. Uh, they were all laughing before we started live that Ariela would walk around campus with a clipboard and, and say, have you joined SSS yet? <laughs> um, so, um, I have, I, I want to welcome people who might just be joining us. Um, if you are just joining us, uh, we have this esteemed panel, this great uh, panel from the College of Education uh, with doctoral students and alumni, and it's made up of Liz Pinon and Brian Hernandez, um, Adali Freire, and Ariela Martinez. And if you have any questions for our panelists, please type it in the comments and we'll, we'll try to answer them uh, when we can. Um, speaking of questions, I've got a couple already. So panelists, if you're okay, we're gonna fly off the cuff here and uh, see what comes our way. Um, our first question comes from Amy on Instagram. And Amy's question is, how can the College of Education go about elevating the voices of female Latinx educators specifically? I think one thing that they've done that I wish I had been able to um, partake in is they brought in a Latina professor. Um, during my four or five years in the program, I never was able to have a professor of, of color, much less a Latina. I wanna, if I want to aspire to be uh, in education and in that position, I wanna see people that look like me, that have an accent like me, um, so it was very empowering to me uh, that we have a new professor at the College of Ed um, who's Latina, uh, Dr. Ozuna, right? Am I correct? Yeah, yeah. I think something that helped when I was there as an undergrad was one professor, I can't recall the name right now, but they said, you're not gonna go into the classroom and be the white savior. Um, that was like a common theme that was across the board in, in um, especially within the EC through six, um, you know, you have the idea that you're gonna go into a title one school and save the kids and all that good stuff. But like, I wanted to, I wanted my students to have someone who looked like them, who comes from the same background as them or a similar background um, that they can look up to. And like Liz was saying, how can I aspire to be something greater if I don't see it? Um, and the College of Ed did a great job of like, allowing me to voice my opinion and say, okay, wait, because I know we had a project about food stamps one time. Um, I know how they work. I haven't been on it, but I know how they work. And my friends were like, $120 for a month isn't enough money. And I was like, okay, well, where are you going? They're like, oh, Trader Joe's, Central Market, and like Target. I was like, oh no, you got to go to like El Rancho, El Monterrey, Superior, like all of the fiesta. That's where you're going to get the deals. You need two pounds of tomatoes for a dollar, go to El Rancho, you know, down the street. Um, so allowing me to be kind of like, um, not a voice, but just an aide, someone there to help them. You know, there are other options that these families um, that are like, like us, we have to go to those or like not have to, but if that's our limited resource, that's where we're going. And Dr. Prismas, this is where I think like voices like Adali is so important and, and like all of ours, um, because it brings a different perspective that um, a lot of our students that do attend don't have that perspective, right? If I had $120 a month, I'm going to survive on that. How am I going to do it? Let me share that with you. When I think of my transition into the College of Ed, because I ended up changing my major and finding myself into the College of Ed, um, it, and I guess it's a common thing with a lot of us because I see a lot of head nods, um, but I remember walking in and just, you know, you're changing your major, there's a lot going on, you're being, you're first gen, low income, trying to navigate the process um, entirely is already a challenge and this weight on your shoulders. But I remember walking in and um, meeting with Melissa Garza. And so at that time, she was academic advisor and just seeing someone who looked like me or who might understand where I'm coming from, 
Um, Because even if you don't really understand my struggle, when I start talking about it, I can connect with you. Um, And I feel that that connection allowed that weight to just melt off my shoulders. And it felt so empowering to say, you know what, to hear that, to hear kind of like the validation from her. Like it is, it is tough. It is tough. You can't be minimizing that it is tough, but at the same time, how are you going to cope and move through this? Um, And so being challenged in a way that came from support and not so in a sense of like, maybe you don't belong here. Yeah, I think, um, I think everyone said fantastic things. Um, I think one of the biggest things um, that I try to convey to students, um, especially, you know, students who might be part of a minority group or a marginalized group that's um, historically underrepresented, um, be careful and try not to fall into imposter syndrome. Um, or even pre-imposter syndrome. Um, I know, for example, and I use my, using my experience, when I first was going through the process of these interviews um, and I was interviewing for Chancellor Scholarship, um, I started meeting other interviewees who, um, you know, were from all across the country and they're like, oh, I've done this, this, and that, and I've done this, this, and that. And I'm like, oh, wow, these are all like way, you know, different experiences than I've had. Um, Should I even be here in the first place? Um, Am I in the right spot? Um, And, you know, it wasn't until afterwards, you know, as I kind of went through the motions at TCU and finished out, I was just like, you know, like I've I've made it to where I've made it, not because, you know, despite maybe not having the same resources as other people, um, but because, you know, there's this drive and passion and that, you know, I have my family to support me, even if they didn't understand the process in the beginning. And there's just always those individuals who are there to boost you up, even if you're not necessarily familiar with the process itself, Um, you know speaking from the college advising side, um, you know, there are a lot of students that you encounter. And if you're a student, you know, same thing to you, you know, a lot of this stuff, whether it be TCU or any other school, um, it can be scary. Um, There's a lot of stuff that goes to it that definitely can seem very complicated. Um, But if you're someone who's like, well, even if I don't know what the process is, you know, all about, um, and I want to do it, definitely go for it, because you'll definitely find people there to support you, um, no matter who you are and where you're coming from. And, you know, no matter who you are and where you're coming from, because of that, um, you'll be able to do fantastic things. It's just a matter of, you know, being able to reach out and say, hey, I need some help. Where do I need to go? Thank you, everyone. Uh, If you're ready, I have another question. They keep coming, so this is great. Um, This question comes from Brian from Facebook, and it says, if you could give one piece of advice to future Latinx students at TCU, what would it be and why? So maybe thinking about people who haven't come yet. Join SSS. (laughs) No, okay. I I will say, I will say absolutely. Yes, join SSS and I will um, to the, to my very last day, always say you've got to find your supports at an institution um, at TCU. So I keep talking about SSS. Um, it's a trio program, so federally funded. Um, we've got SSS, so Student Support Services, but also McNair, um, which is for students who um, are coming from marginalized backgrounds as, as well, but want to go on to graduate school. So that had another level of confidence for me and allowed me to explore lots of different areas that I just, I wouldn't have known about. Even if I would have explored on my own, I was trying to navigate it on my own. Um, And so that leads me to my next one. Don't navigate things on your own. Use your resources, connect with people, um, make sure since day one, when you feel that sense of maybe you don't belong or discomfort, use that to figure out, to to kind of push forward and figure out how can you make this a space where you don't feel that anymore um, or where you minimize that and are able to then maximize your educational experience and opportunities. Um, No matter what institution you go to, um, you're you're navigating a very complex dynamic type of intersectionality of identities, being first gen, low income, Latinx. Um, If you happen to learn English as a second language or your parents did as well, all these levels of discomfort that it bring, find your people that um, can help you work through that. Um, if you happen to have a crazy lady running around with the clipboard, please listen to her. Uh, fun fact, Ariella chased me down so many times my freshman year. She's like, Adali, have you joined? No, not yet. Adali, come join. Sign this. Sign this here. Do you have your XYZ? And I was like, oh my gosh, this lady's so crazy. But now she's like one of my best friends. And She got me through college so nicely. My freshman year could not have been what it was if it wasn't for Ariela. Um, So thank you to you. (laughs) But yes, listen to the crazy lady. Um, Always go. I say my biggest regret from like starting college was not 
expanding like my horizons, trying out new things, even just walking around campus. Even if you see someone like throwing a Frisbee, maybe join if you're that extroverted. Um, if you're not as extroverted as myself, maybe go ahead and just look at the library. Just go walk around, um, make it, make college your home. Because if you don't feel at home, you're not gonna wanna stay. Yeah, definitely, you know, talking to people. Um, there's that one famous saying, it's not always about what you know, but about who you know. Um, but you don't know who you know if you don't go around and talk to people. Um, you know, there's a lot of people who, you know, they're still, you know, great friends even to this day, um, even after I've graduated from TCU, um, that I met just kind of randomly walking by. Um, there are coworkers that I have right now that I'm like, when I first met them as a coworker, I'm like, hey, I used to see you around campus and I used to just say hi. I never asked your name and I had no idea who you were, but I'd always say hi. And look at that, we're now working together. Um, uh, and I definitely think that, you know, knowing familiar faces or even if they're unfamiliar faces, taking a chance and just kind of saying, hey, you know, I'm Brian. Nice to meet you. I, I live over there. Um, what's your favorite place to go eat? Because I'm hungry. Um, but just kind of, you know, trying to make those connections can really make or break your college experience. Um, so, you know, if you're like Adali also said, you know, I've always been a bit of an introvert, but um, sometimes you got to flex those speaking skills and saying hello skills to be able to make those connections. I agree. This is all wonderful advice. I have a niece coming in in the fall, so I will make sure that she signs up for SSS and, and McNair. Uh, but also uh, telling people your story. Take the time to like, like you all talked about that, but also in classes, share your story. Um, I, it's valuable and um, I think that others need to hear our stories and um, that's just my piece of advice. Thank you. You're all gonna be able to knock this next one out of the park and I can't wait to hear you talk about it. Uh, what influenced you to attend college? So we're, going, we're going there. What influenced you to attend, to attend college socially, emotionally, academically? Can I jump in real quick? Real quick, my mom said, first the masters and then the mister, always. So this is something that all my life growing up, this is what my mom uh, like, inculcate, me lo metí en la cabeza, primero el master y luego el mister. Uh, so she, it, it, education was really important to my mother. And she made sure that um, that was something that I was keeping in the forefront. I love that. Like Liz, uh, my parents from a young age, like you're going to college. And I was like, okay, yeah. So he's a third grader. They're like, what do you see yourself doing? I'm going to college. What are you doing? I don't know, but I'm going to college. So you kind of, I, I grew up hearing you're going to college and then high school came around and I kept hearing it and whatnot. So my parents had the biggest influence. Um, so my freshman year, I had separation anxiety just because I had never left my house like ever. So going to college, being on your own was a big step. Um, but yeah, having them in there saying, hey, you're almost done. Like, just get this degree. Like, you're going to get it. Um, that support system is really nice. Yeah, definitely parents here as well. Um, I think for my parents, it was a lot, um, you know, I grew up in a household where at the time, both of my parents were undocumented. Um, and so part of my story has always been, you know, like we came here um, and you have this opportunity, Brian, take advantage of it. Um, you know, do everything that you can with what you have now available to you that other people don't. Um, so very same, you know, all throughout high school, you go into college, where are you going to go? A uh, school in Texas somewhere, I don't know. Um, I also, I, I mentioned previously that I had a college advisor that kind of helped me put, put me on the right track. Um, thank goodness, because I was a little bit more all over the place um, as a high school student, but um, I definitely wouldn't be where I am right now if it wasn't for the help and support from my family. Absolutely. Uh, the support from the family, um, friends or people who are just in your corner that are supporting saying like, hey, how's it going? Checking in on the, the journey for you are all part of that, that village that raises you to um, seek higher education. And so when I was in school, I, I actually didn't go to a school that was, um, I guess, Title I in a sense to where we had a lot of resources. We didn't have a college advisor. Um, and so my main resource was myself and my mom. Um, and so we had to make sure that we were putting it, you know, unfortunately all our eggs in these baskets um, to focus on getting to college. Um, but at the same time, even through graduate school, um, my tias, my tios, everyone, my grandparents who are just pushing and pushing and saying, how's it going? We're so proud of you. And that um, the proudness that they have 
it, it just gave me chills actually, but <laughs> the how proud your family is um, really helps more than you can even imagine that just indirect support. They may not know how to navigate college, how to navigate the system, how to get you to and through, but them just being there is pushing you more than you even think of. So it kind of goes back to another piece of advice I have for students. Don't lose your supports. If those are your supports, make sure to maintain those relationships with your people. Uh, one last tidbit. I think also in the College of Ed, it was it was more of a sense because so I stayed an extra year to get my master's degree, um, but it was never a question if I was going to do it. It was more of like, OK, well, I'll see you next year. And you're just like, OK, yeah. So it, it was never like there's so much support there and so many people in your corner that you don't even see it as not an option. You see it as a why not? Let's just do it. Come on. Like you have the support. You know what we're getting into. And so having that college of having the people in the college of ed believing you as well like that was amazing because it kept me going it kept me like okay yeah i can get my master's why not awesome thank you um if you're just joining us welcome to this esteemed panel with the college of education we have some current doctoral students liz delia pinon ariela martinez um alumni brian hernandez adali Freire, escalante thank you so much for being here um and if you have questions for us, you can drop them in the comments. Uh, we're currently answering questions that are coming in right now. Um, that last one was from Lara from on Facebook. Um, and this one, um, Brian, this is kind of specifically to you. So I'm going to tee you up here. It's from um, Marissa from Instagram. Um, Marissa at, says, Brian, you talked about the fact that you currently work uh, in the high school you attended as a mentor. Um, how have you seen the perception of TCU evolve among high schools in this community? What a great question. Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, yeah, I think the perception of TCU um, shifts, especially in high schools, um, when you talk about these resources that are available to students, and I'll explain that kind of more in detail. Um, so, you know, I feel when I was in high school, so I graduated from high school in 2014, um, you know, TCU is almost like this um, ivory tower that even though it was right down the street, it was still like, oh, it's TCU. It's such a, you know, it has this kind of lofty atmosphere about it. Um, you know, how can someone from the south side of Fort Worth or the east side of Fort Worth, you know, manage to find, you know, a rope to throw it over the turret and then climb up and get into that ivory tower? Um, but I think when you start sharing all of these resources and information to students, such as scholarship opportunities, um, or even different pathways, such as Ariella took, you know, starting, you know, in one place and then transferring over, all of a sudden it seems to click a lot more for students. Um, and I find that it's spreading information that really helps, you know, combat that feeling of like, oh, well, I can't do this because I don't have, there's just no way to that path or to that, you know, particular target. Um, so, you know, one of the things I think that the, um, I love, I've loved about working as a college advisor in the college advising corps, and even especially here in my alma mater, is that I get to come back, I've gotten to come back and say, you know, I was, I was a poly student just like you guys, you know, I've walked these same high school halls, um, uh, that teacher over there that you don't want to go to his classroom, I kind of didn't want to go to his classroom at one point either, but, you know, we still, you know, I did what I needed to do and I got where I needed to go um, because I used, took advantage of the resources that were available to me. Um, and like many of the other panelists had said, you know, I think, I feel like there's a stigma behind asking for help and asking for resources um, when in, you know, on in the inverse, that's probably one of the best things you could possibly do. Um, I always tell students there's tons of, for example, scholarship opportunities. There's tons of different pathways that you can take, um, but you can't take them if you don't know about them. Um, so I think, you know, over the years, as I've been able to share more, and now that we have more advisors um, throughout Fort Worth ISD, you know, sharing more of this information, TCU and, you know, you know, a secondary education as a whole has become less of, oh, this mystical castle that I can't really get to, to, oh, there are a lot of different gates into that castle. I just need to ask the right people to help me get in. And even then, it's not even a castle at this point. Hope that answered the question. I think that was great, Brian. Um, I'm gonna ask a similar question that, um, you know, when we thought about this panel and we had some pre-questions come in um, prior to the date uh, that we wanted to get to, and it was really similar, and the question, is how do we demystify the process of getting to TCU? 
Um, you started touching on that a little bit, Brian. And, um, you know, TCU is right in the middle kind of, of, of Fort Worth. And I don't know if the community sees it as part of their community, as part of their home. As, so how do we demystify that? You know, do we, how do we talk about the cost of attending TCU? How do we talk about paying for it, all the resources? And we want to get to that too before the hour's up is um, the resources that students can access. Uh, but how do we demystify the process? I think a lot of that comes from demystifying um, the idea of TCU and the image and the stigma of TCU um, that, it, that already does exist for a lot of students. Um, and so I feel like you don't have this lack of elementary or middle school students rooting TCU and saying, I want to go to TCU and they have the shirt and they have whatever, the whole nine yards of support for TCU. But at some point, there's this gap that by the time they hit high school, um, whether it be financial financial pieces connect a little better and they understand money or they understand the struggle that it might put on themselves or their parents. Um, a lot of it is that financial capital. When I, um, so I work as an admission counselor for our students that transfer from TCC. Um, and the number one concern is always money. It's always money and I get it because that was my concern as well too. Um, and so I think part of demystifying is educating um, our communities that um, TCU is accessible, and so what I always tell students is that you are telling yourself no, you're not giving yourself that opportunity to attend TCU if you don't even try, if you don't apply, if you don't do the financial aid, um, whether you go to a community scholar school or not, um, by not advocating for yourself, by seeking financial aid, by doing more, I mean, you've got to have that intrinsic motivation, of course, but at the same time, by doing all the steps that make it more accessible, um, if you don't do that, you're telling yourself no. So I would always tell students, if you don't apply, then of course, for you, it's the sticker price. It's however much 50 something thousand dollars of tuition um, because you didn't apply for financial aid. Um, so you need to instead apply for financial aid, apply for scholarships. It's still, it's still a reach, of course, financially, um, but you've got to start somewhere. Thank you, Ariela. I think it's important, uh, Dr. Prismas, that uh, we're reaching out to those communities, uh, to our schools in the neighborhood and, and um, finding a way to knock on these doors and saying, hey, you're wanted here, we need you here. What can you do to get here? Let's, let's figure it out. Uh, if we're finding a need, like there's such a big need right now in Fort Worth area for bilingual teachers, right? Well, we have all these communities uh, just down the road where the, bulk of the community speaks Spanish. So what can we do to help uh, Fort Worth community uh, buy into that? How can we get uh, that community to come and learn with us, right? We have one of the best bilingual programs. So how can we bring those Spanish speakers or any other language speakers to our, to our door? Uh, so maybe knocking on those doors and, and showing them that, that they're wanted and how to help them apply and get here. I love to hear that, you know, we, we already have a 100% placement rate for our teachers that graduate from our College of Education. But if you're a bilingual teacher, you have offers coming in. I go to schools all the time to observe lots of, of student teachers, but the principals will say to me, do you have some bilingual teachers? Do you have some, you know, yeah, I have a couple. I want more, um, you know, and I'm so blessed to work um, with all of you. It's, it's um, been such a, a great, great part of my job. Um, Brian, I didn't mean to cut you off if you were going to say something about the demystification process. Nope, just ditto to what most other folks have said. Um, you know, reach out. Some, sometimes it can be hard, especially so if you're a student, for example, and if you're talking about motivation, I know sometimes it can be hard to say like, oh, well, I don't know if I want to do this or not. Um, but if at any point, you know, you've thought about, you know, hey, this is something that I want to accomplish, know that it's possible. Um, you just got to find, you know, some folks and some resources to help you out. Um, and I can guarantee you that wherever you are, whether you have a college advisor, or even if you don't have one, I bet you there's a counselor, I bet you there's a teacher, there is someone wherever you are that wants you to succeed. Um, 
and working together with them and looking for different resources, you can get where you need to be, um, whether it's TCU or any other place. Thank you. I want to circle back to this question of resources, and I know we've we've prepared a slide that will end this um, this platica, this um, this chat session today, um, listing some resources for for potential students, and then we'll also record this and make it available on our Facebook page as well. But I want to um, before we get to that, I want to go to uh, two questions that are sitting in my chat box um, for you all. And the first one is from Maddie on Instagram. And Maddie asks uh, or says, you know, I'm interested in coming to TCU, but worried I won't be able to find a community. What is your advice for combating imposter syndrome and finding your people? I'll try and start off. Um kind of going a bit from my experience at TCU. Uh, so when I was a freshman at TCU, so it was my first year, you know, I was a fresh, fresh off the high school press. Um, I was just like, oh, wow, I'm in college now in university and taking all these classes. What now? Um, I kind of, I've always been someone who, it's a little bit harder for me initially to kind of make some connections with people just because, you know, I've always been a bit more of an introvert. I'm kind of, I'm more of an observer initially when I first meet you. Um, but one of the things that I found, and I feel like we touched upon this briefly is, um, but one of the things that I found my first year is just walking around and just kind of, you know, if you see like a hubbub of activity or if you see there's some kind of weird event with music going on somewhere, just kind of go to it, just kind of gravitate towards it. Um, even if you don't necessarily, you kind of get closer and you're just like, oh, it seems cool what they're doing, but maybe I don't want to engage with that. That's a great first start um, because as you do that, you'll find that at TCU, there's always something happening. Um, you know, it's a little bit different right now with COVID, but whenever it's a non-COVID time and especially when in-person starts to go back to being more of a norm, um, there's always something happening at TCU. Um, whether it be some club organization is having an event, whether they there's a petting zoo. Um, sometimes we have some local folks who bring you know animals of all kinds and people go and pet them to relieve some stress. And you might find a friend who happens to like the same goat that you do. Um, and from there, you know, a friendship might start. Um, I think, you know, having a little bit of bravery and just venturing out and just gravitating towards places where you see people, um, I think is one of the, for me at least, it was one of the best ways I think that you can do it. Um, and you realize as you make those connections that, you know, a lot of the people that are at these events or just kind of on campus are the same as you, you know, they're a lot of, the, they're binging the same Netflix shows, their, their favorite place to go eat is the same place that you like to go eat. Um, you know, maybe what happens at home for them, their familial experience was very similar to what you had. Um, but you don't know any of that if you don't talk to them first. Um, so just, you know, you can start off by kind of gravitating towards one place, but taking that first step and just saying, yo, I'm so-and-so, I like that goat that you're petting. Um, that can be definitely a great way to start. By the way, Goat Buddies is already trending on all social media uh, platforms. Uh, thanks for that, Brian. I'd say one piece of it. Um, so it was shared earlier, um, but to to share your story, like Liz said, share your story, connect with people um, so that you know you can reflect on what your needs are. Um, what are you looking for? Are you looking specifically to get more involved in the community or for leadership opportunities or um, specifically to be able to um, find goats and play, you know, have game nights and stuff? What is it that you're looking for? Reflect on that a bit and then talk to people. Because there are, I mean, TCU, we have staff members that they're professional staff members. It's their job to help you get connected. Um, so whether it's on the first year side or the transfer side, um, there are not only staff members, but also students who you can reach out to, whether it be your orientation leaders, your RAs, um, people that were part of the connections um, program to help get you connected into TCU um, and help you make that experience what it is that you're wanting it to be. Um, and at the same time, when you do go to events, uh, as Brian was saying, like there's always something going on. 
go to events. Don't sit in your room. Um, don't be going home all the time because it's right down the street or mom made enchiladas and you want to go into enchiladas. Like be part of going to eat at the blue with your friends. And all of that is part of the experience and you're making friends, you're making part of your experience be something that it wouldn't be if you keep going home or if you stay in your room, you've got to get out and get involved. I agree. One of the most important things I've learned is from my experience at TCU is las conexiones que haces. Those, those connections are what's most important. Uh, you know, even in the future, my, my jobs that I've been able to obtain, it's because of someone I might have met at TCU uh, doing whatever it is that I, you know, at the blue or, or someone that I happen to meet at an alumni meeting. Uh, so the connections is an important part of being successful from TCU that I'm, I'm taking with me. Thank you. Um, if you're just joining us, we've got about 14 minutes left on this, um, the Power of Platicas live chat with the College of Education. Um, we, our panelists are Liz de la Pinon, um, Brian Hernandez and Ariela Martinez. And we did have uh, Adale uh, Freire Escalante and I think she had to go back and teach. Um, so uh, we just lost her, but we had her for the first half or so. Um, if you have questions, you feel free to drop it in uh, the comments and they come to me and I, I'm scrolling through them and asking the panelists. Um, I want to circle back to a question that's been sitting in my inbox for a little bit. Uh, that we haven't really talked about yet. And then I wanna make sure we get to the what's next. What's the next steps? Where do we go from here? Um, and this question, um, it's from Facebook. It says, all of you mentioned your parents as a huge support of your choice to attend college. But what if your family doesn't support you? What if the culture of getting a job and starting a family is the influence? What advice do you have for those incoming students uh, that want more than that? It's a great question, um, and I think it's a, it's definitely one to think about. Just because I know I have, ha I've had a lot of friends who you know come from very similar experiences to what was described. You know, um, families will say, "Oh, well, you're about to graduate high school. You're going to have your high school diploma. Time to get to work. Um, time to go find a job and make some money." Um, and I find that one of the things that is um, that you sort of kind of have to explain, especially, you know, to maybe some parents who, for example, say, oh, well, we got to make money once you're out of high school, is that um, college and, you know, some kind of post-secondary education is an investment. Um, it's not like you're going to school and just kind of hanging out and then all of a sudden you have a piece of paper and then cool, you're done hanging out. Um, you know, post-secondary education, um, no matter kind of what that looks like, um, whether it is at TCU or somewhere else, um, it's an investment at the end of the day, you're going to get so much more return for not only, you know, financially, of course, um, and, you know, the statistics can back you up there. Um, but, you know, like those connections that everyone has mentioned, you know, um, your next employer or the person, the people that you work for might work, have come from, you know, someone that you met, talked to on campus. Um, and that might be someone who you would have never met if you hadn't gone, you know, to TCU or to some kind of post-secondary education. Um, I find often um, when I'm talking, especially to my Hispanic guys, um, you know, a lot of them, you know, I want to talk to my students and they're like, oh, well, mister, I'm just going to go to work and I'm going to, you know, you know, I want to work in a shop or I'm going to be an electrician with my dad. Um, and I explain, you know, like, well, that's fantastic. Um, you know, there are certifications that you can get for that. And then you'll be making even more money because now you'll have those credentials to back you up. And they're like, oh, really, mister? And I'm like, yeah. Um, I think it's a matter of, um, once again, it comes down to that education piece, you know, you know, families might not understand what necessarily a, you know, post-secondary education can do for an individual or for their student, for their child, um, or for you, if, you, if you're a student right now listening. Um, and it's not necessarily because they don't want you to succeed, um, but it's more so it's just, you know, having these conversations and explaining to families, you know, School isn't just a place where I go and I sit there and then I leave and I'm done, you know, I'm gaining all these experiences, I'm gaining this knowledge and these connections. Um, and at the end of the day, these things are what's really going to enrich not only our, our bank accounts, I guess, in one way, um, but our family as a whole, because then you yourself will be able to tell other family members what it's like to go through post-secondary education.
I think it is that education piece. It's more so kind of just ditto to what Brian said. Um, but when I did work as a college advisor, a lot of it is having those conversations to where you can work, of course, but how can you enhance um, those experiences or reach a level to where you can make better of an income um, by going to work? So even for my students, um, even, especially male students who wanted to go on and be a barber or be an electrician, um, there are so many workforce and trade programs that are different from the ideal typical um, college route where people think a four year school, you're going to live on campus and all of that. Um, you've got to think of all the different opportunities as well. Um, and so at that same point, if a student isn't even aware of these, how can we expect the parents to be? Um, so it is a, a huge education piece. And that's why I'm so thankful to have come from the College of Education, um, the College of Corps program. And at the same time, uh, during my time as a graduate student in the counseling program, one tool that I really took away that used with a lot of students was called um, Texas Reality Check. And so when I use this with students, uh, it's because they say, you know, oh, I want to have this big house and I want to have this really nice car. Like, I want you to have that too, but do we realize what this means? What this means for in terms of the money that you need to make, um, the type of lifestyle that you want to live. Um, and so I would use this tool to where the student could go in and say, these are the, this is the kind of lifestyle that I want. Um, and so this Texas reality check system would allow the students to see like, okay, well, if I got to make that much money, but I want to work at who knows where and it makes ten dollars an hour is that really aligning with what i'm wanting does that align does that make sense um, and so using tools again the education piece of being able to educate students and parents i can use that tool with parents as well so i want to um i want to take some time to to end our platica today talking about what's next what's what are the next steps uh, what are some of the takeaways? What's one thing, at least, that the College of Education could do right now to elevate student voices? What's missing? I'd like to jump in. Uh, I think we need a really dedicated space where we could have these conversations, uh, Dr. Prismas. It, it's not a physical place. We don't need, um, but we need uh, just a place where uh, like-minded people could come together and have these conversations, maybe with other faculty members or, or um, staff that look like us or that have our same backgrounds or, or our same, uh, maybe our same social economic status that we came from. Uh, just having a, a, a space and not just saying, oh, remember we had that one talk in October. Um, no, this, this is something that has to be done all the time. Uh, with, with our students, with our faculty, um, having a space to just come in and, and be able to talk. This is what's going on this week. Did you hear that news report about this that happened? Um, you know, or this happened at the blue to me. What, what do you think we can do to make this better for other students so they don't have that same experience? So coming together and, and putting things in place uh, where people could, could share their experiences and at the same time constructively figure out Hey, let's let's maybe we can talk to this person and they'll make that better. Or, or is there a way we can cut the application fee uh, for students that come from this place? So just having those those conversations all the time. I think for the College of Education, definitely something I think um, to consider and think about is you know encouraging moments where you can share your story and your experiences. Um, so very similar to what Liz said, um, but more so in the fact that, you know, a lot of uh, individuals, you know, no matter where they come came from, you know, at some point they were a high school student. Um, you know, if you're if you made it to TCU, you were a high school student at some point. What was your experience then? And what's something that you now would do to make that high school experience better or smoother? You know, one of my favorite things that I like to do, um, I panel often for different, you know, things, you know, whether it be scholarship panels or whatever. And I've always loved to ask students um, as a fun question is like, if you can go back in time to your freshman self, what is a piece of advice that you tell your freshman self um, that, you know, hopefully would make your process easier? Um, and a lot of students, you know, will say stuff like time, you know, time management organization, things like that. Um, but I think um, rarely do us as adults and as working professionals, do we think about our experiences and then say, you know, what did I want um, 
when I was in that particular scenario and what could have made my process, you know, run smoother and run better, um, you know, and having, you know, like Liz said, I really like the idea of, you know, creating spaces where we can share, you know, some of these things where like, this was something that I had difficulty with perhaps when I was going through this process, what can we do to help alleviate it? What can we do to make this smoother for those who come, you know, in the future and also, you know, to de-stigmify and to demystify, as uh, Dr. Prismas mentioned earlier, the whole process of going through post-secondary education, getting to a post-secondary education, and following through. So those share and thinking spaces, I, de I definitely think, are worth exploring. Ditto again. Definitely, um, the representation is a huge piece, um, not only for myself, but I hear it from incoming students. Um, all the time, that they want to see more people like them, whether it is faculty or staff roles. Um, and so I'm glad to see that the College of Education, TCU as a whole, but also specifically the College of Education, has been doing more and already moving the needle here. Um, so we have a faculty member who is of the Latina community. Um, we also have um, other opportunities like this to be able to elevate these voices and have spaces. Um, and at the same time, have people that can connect with others um, and in a sense, to me, regardless of what background you come from, the College of Education has people who just make you feel at home. Um, it might just be the background of pedagogy and understanding students' needs um, and be able to support on that sense. Um, but representation entirely is, is something that incoming students are looking for. And then when they get here, we want to be able to match that and say, yes, we do have this. Um, so I've been working with Dean Hernandez actually on a program to help increase male minority teacher education kind of pathways for students. Um, and so just seeing that and being able to speak on that when I'm at events um, is insightful. And so we are doing a lot of good. We just need to keep that up and even do more. How else can we um, continue to further this momentum that we have? I agree, we could always do more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I wanna thank you so much. Um, I want to, I, I see that we're at about a minute and a half um, until the hour. And I know we have a resources page. Um, and Vivian, I know you, you can hear me. <laughs> um, I wonder if there's a possibility to be able to share the page and have us still be able to talk about it. I know our, um, hey, there we go. Um, <laughs> Awesome. So, Ariella, you just mentioned, um, were you talking about the Maestro program? Yes. So exciting. Mm -hmm. Give us a little, are, can you give us a little, um, you know, shout out to the Maestro program? I can too. But I'll, Absolutely. I'll um, so this is more so a, a program created to help increase the amount of male minority students that are entering TCU to be able to study um, an education pathway type field. Um, and so when talking with Dean Hernandez about this, what was so exciting was he had already done all this work behind the scenes, talking to people at TCC or different programs to where I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm connected with those same people. Um, and I'm talking to prospective students all the time. So being able to have the flyer and tell students about it, um, but at the same time advising or letting the advisors know, like Brian, who are in the schools, saying that these programs are there has been so helpful um, to share. Again, it goes back to the education piece, educating the community on it, um, but ensuring that because there is that lack of um, not only Latinx people in, in education in general, but also just in the classroom as a teacher. Like Liz was saying, even bilingual educators, we, it is a high need. We need everyone to kind of jump in. Um, and so this was more so an access piece that I'm very proud to be a part of. So thank you, Dean Hernandez. Yeah. I want to say thank you too. It's a great program. Um, it's super organized. Um, it's going to provide um, a lot of the support that you all talked about uh, the, from the questions that came up in the chat about, okay, and now I'm here. How do I feel accepted? How do I feel supported? How do I find my, my community? I know that the Maestro program is going to have a cooperating teacher academy. It's going to have a study abroad component. It's going to have a professional seminar. Um, that's really cool. And it's all going to be structured around this learning by scientific design. Um, it's going to be a great program. And um, I look forward to uh, seeing, um, you know, who it brings into the College of Education and how many students are impacted by that 
in the future of seeing themselves and the teacher standing in front of them. Um, so we're at two o'clock and um, I want everyone to know that that has been watching this, that we have recorded it and we are going to um, have this video available on our Facebook page. And I just want to thank, um, I want to thank Liz and Ariela and Brian and Adali, que ya se fue already, but, um, and, and again, Vivian and Leslie and Dina Hernandez for, for working to make this event possible. Uh, and thank you all of you watching on Facebook. Uh, I want, I hope we see you next time. Uh, if you would like to reach out to any of our panelists, their contact information will be on the next slide. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day, everyone.